Hello everyone and depending where you're joining from, good afternoon, good morning and good evening. Um, welcome to our event, Holding Companies to Account, how new EU laws can help protect people and the planet against corporate abuses. My name is Rachel Owens and I'm the Head of Global Witnesses EU Office and lead on our global campaign on corporate accountability. This event is co-organised by Global Witness, Anti-Slavery International and Clean Clothes Campaign. And we're so pleased to be joined by a fantastic lineup of speakers from the EU institutions, but also from our global partners all around the world. On our last count, we had 730 people sign up to this event globally. So I'd like to welcome all our participants and thank you so much for joining. Before we begin, please be sure to um, select your preferred language at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So we have live interpretation in English, French, Spanish and Portuguese. To select your language, please click on the globe icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen and you can select English, French, Spanish or Portuguese depending on your preferred language. And this is also just a reminder to all our fantastic panelists to please stay on mute while your, um, your fellow panelists are speaking. And many thanks to all of you who have sent in questions in advance. We have designed our questions to the speakers based on your feedback. And given our fantastic lineup and tight agenda, unfortunately, we won't have time for further questions today, um, but we have um, included your questions already in our questions to the, to the speakers. We've had a few changes to today's program due to illness. However, the organizations advertised will still be represented today. So today we're going to discuss why we need new EU laws to protect people and our planet. We see daily news reports linking companies and their financiers to projects that result in environmental harm, land grabbing and serious human rights harms such as modern slavery, child labour and the killing of environmental defenders. The, the COVID global health pandemic has also lain bare how vulnerable companies and um, supply chains are to serious shocks and how more than often the most vulnerable workers and communities very much bear the brunt of the lack of international legal mechanisms to hold companies to account. The good news is that the EU is leading the way globally to legislate on corporate accountability. Last year, Commissioner, um, European Commissioner for Justice Didier Reinders, who we're delighted will join us today, committed to bringing in new legislation this year. As part of the preparation for the upcoming legislation, the European Commission published a public consultation from October last year to the beginning of February this year. And together with Anti-Slavery International and Clean Clothes Campaign, Global Witness launched a campaign called Protect People and Planet. It was designed to ensure affected communities, environmental defenders, national and local civil society partners and trade unions and worker organizations all around the world were aware of the consultation and could respond. This work was also done in partnership with Avaz to ensure we reached a truly global audience. We wanted to make sure that victims and organizations that are directly impacted by corporate right, um, human rights and environmental abuses could take an active part in the consultation and the subsequent legislative process that will ultimately lead to the adoption of a new EU law. And given the far ranging impacts that this law will have, people's opinion from all over the globe should be heard by the Commission. So what was the response? In one word, it was overwhelming. Julia, if you could now show the slide. We had a huge response from global voices and organisations. A total of around 450,000 responses were submitted to the Commission. This input came from almost 200 countries and territories all around the globe. This includes approximately 700 society organizations, including NGOs, trade unions and academic institutions from all around the world. And it means that not only are European and global citizens voices heard, but crucially organizations that are working on human rights and environmental issues are also raising their voice. We'll hear more about this campaign later from my colleague, Chloe from Anti-Slavery International. So now it's my great pleasure to introduce the European Commissioner for Justice, Didier Reinders. 
Commissioner Reinders is responsible for the sustainable corporate governance legislation due to be published this year. He has played a significant role in ensuring the EU is showing global leadership in tackling corporate abuse. We strongly welcome the Commissioner's commitment to propose new legislation and would like to thank him for all of his work so far, in particular his commitment to an ambitious proposal. So I'll now hand over to you, Commissioner, for your keynote speech. Okay. Now, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, thank you uh, to the organizers for inviting me uh, here today to explain again what we uh, try to uh, propose at the upper level. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm sure that we share a common goal to tackle the environmental and climate emergency and ensure that um, social and human rights in the supply chain of companies are respected. And, uh, and it's very important to say, not just closest at home. Uh, we also share the knowledge that the most flagrant uh, violations of human rights, such as forced labor, don't happen in the first tier of the value chain, but further down. And the truth is that um, without legally binding measures, it is extremely unlikely that the kind of protection that is needed will be afforded by every businesses. I say every businesses because I know there are many that are already doing brilliant work on a voluntary basis, but to reach uh, the necessary scale to have an impact, we need everybody's contribution. In addition, if there are human rights abuses in one company or another is causing toxic harm to the environment we share, everyone of us suffers. So we need rules that apply to everyone. And they need to be EU-wide rules. Uh, like businesses, some member states or so are working on this. To date, 15 of the EU's uh, member states have developed national action plans on business and human rights. 11 C uh, movements for mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence in Europe. Only three. France, the Netherlands, and Italy have legislation in place. The German government put forward uh, in the last weeks a proposal on mandatory due diligence. But in fact, France is the only country to have a general mandatory due diligence requirement for both human rights and environmental impacts. In a single market, we need to avoid fragmentation by a multitude of different rules, and we need to provide legal certainty for businesses. This is why we are working on new EU-wide rules. The question now is what the rules should look like in practice. Good corporate governance means two things uh, to us. Corporate decisions that uh, look at the sustainable and long-term interest of the companies, and that take into account the interest of workers, customers, and other stakeholders, so all the stakeholders. And the proper identification and management of a company's risks and vulnerabilities and due diligence along the company's supply chains. The intention of the commission is to address both the director's duty and the due diligence of the corporation. It's very important to work on the director duties of care and maybe as a part of the process, a due diligence of the corporation. I also want to underline before going any further that our work is sustainable corporate governance will not stop when we publish this proposal. Of course, we are working on a sustainable corporate governance initiative, but it's our intention to make sure it fits in with the work of the commission in other areas. And we need to have a coherence with other instruments. Uh, for example, the review of the non-financial reporting directive, uh, currently ongoing, which covers public reporting by companies of corporate due diligence duties. In the future, there could also be mandatory due diligence for selected sectors or products sold in the EU. For instance, the deforestation initiative. It is our intention to make sure it fits in with the work of the Commission internationally. 
new uh, EU-wide rules on sustainable corporate governance um, must take into account inter 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 internationally recognized human rights and labor standards. They must build on the United Nations guiding principles on business and human rights, and they must build on the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises and due diligence guidance for responsible business conduct. So we will try to be sure that it's possible to apply different kinds of um, guidelines coming from different organizations. Of course, of course, also to verify a correct application of different international conventions like the ILO conventions. But the commission is also exploring how to align the rules to international commitments and possibly other EU goals, such as the 2050 climate neutrality objective and the EU's biodiversity goals. Of course, the next question is, who do the rules apply to? The desired outcome of a level playing field for European companies implies the need for broad coverage. I personally believe that all companies with limited liability in all sectors can be covered. But I also see that there are activities that present higher risks than others. How this should be addressed is currently being carefully analyzed. There is also a question of the company's size. Some have more resources and bargaining power than others. And I'm very attentive to the reality and the needs of small and medium-sized businesses. But of course, it's very important to, to think to the large company. We, are, we have seen that there are many discussions about the listed companies but, uh, and listed uh, SMEs too, but also the high-risk SMEs at least. So we analyze for the moment how it will be possible to define such a kind of a category of high-risk SMEs. We are also examining whether the rules could also apply to some companies from third countries operating in the European Union. These companies could be determined by turnover in the EU or presence in the single market, for example. Then there is a question of enforcement. If this is not effective, then it doesn't really matter what the rules are because they won't achieve the desired impact on the ground. There needs to be a proper enforcement regime, uh, possibly including civil liability and administrative supervision. On the basis of our current findings, we can already see that liability limited to first tier suppliers may not be effective in addressing all the risk and uh, in meeting the objective of our initiatives. We are currently looking into the possibility of liability of the, uh, of the company if it does not carry out due diligence properly and causes harm. And we are also considering establishing board responsibility for sustainability risks and where due diligence is not implemented. Whatever the outcome, the utmost care will be taken to ensure that the new law and its obligations are sufficiently clear so that it does not generate unnecessary litigation. I must say that uh, we are working on all those issues to be ready in some weeks to come with a more detailed proposal. But again, with a very broad scope, all the sectors, it's an horizontal approach, a very important number of companies and certainly the large companies and the high risk SMEs, I said, and with the possibility to go far in the supply chain, because uh, I know that there are many requests to discuss not only about environmental issues, but also human rights like forced labor, child labor. And if you want to fight against forced labor and uh, child labor, you need to go far in the supply chain. And so it's very important to, to repeat that. Um, work, of course, on the, this initiative is very much, I said, in progress. The findings I refer to also come from the public uh, consultation you have shown uh, the situation, which closed on 8 of February. And the experts are now analyzing an unprecedented amount of contribution. It's true that we are talking about almost half a million responses. It is already clear um, there is support for all the planned elements of the forthcoming legislative proposal. A majority of respondents support an EU legal framework for due diligence. Mostly, 
because it will provide legal certainty and thereby will assure a level playing field for companies and not a fragmentation through many national legislation in the 27 member states. The replies will feed into our impact assessment and will help us prepare the initiative. Here I want to thank Mrs. Lara Walters uh, with us, with us uh, today, specifically and the organizations here today uh, who I have, whom I have met on previous occasions to discuss these initiatives. I'm hoping that it will be possible to see a, a very large support in the European Parliament after the work done by Lara Walters as rapporteur uh, on uh, her initiative. Uh, there are a lot of expectations on this proposal. As usual, the Commission will strike a very careful balance among the various interests at stake and the various demands. Uh, this balance exercise implies that not all requests can be fully taken on board. However, what is important, and I want to stress this, is that every contribution has been carefully assessed and that the final proposal is very well thought through. I want to reiterate once more my full commitment and that of my team to work hard to achieve a proposal that is sound, balanced, and ambitious. So again, it will be an horizontal approach with a very broad scope and with two parts, one dedicated to the uh, director duties of care and one to the uh, due diligence process. But again, a due diligence process uh, through the entire supply chain to be sure that it's possible to have a real uh, effect on all the different uh, goals that we will uh, try to reach. And again, not only climate change and bi biodiversity, but also human rights issues and social uh, issues. So thank you again for the support of many of you for such a kind of initiative. And we'll continue to be uh, in a good relation to try to see what is the support that we will have to the end of the process in June in the Commission, and then, of course, uh, with the co-legislator in the Parliament and the Council to be able to have, as soon as possible, again, uh, AU binding uh, instrument through uh, different kind of uh, concrete elements that I've present today. Thanks again. Thank you so much, Commissioner, for your um, really interesting um, intervention. Um, very, very interesting, particularly when you were talking about um, the fact that legal liability for first tier suppliers wouldn't work um, and certainly something which we are interested in as a, as a civil society movement. Um, so we'll now move on to hear from our two Global South speakers um, and they have a couple of questions for you, Commissioner. And so I hope that you're able to stay uh, a few more minutes to hear their interventions and their questions. Um, so I'd now like to welcome our next speaker, um, who we're very pleased is joining us from, Col from Colombia. Her name is Angelica Ortiz. Angelica is a leading figure in the indigenous rights organization, the YU um, Women's um, Force Movement. Um, for years, she has been protesting against one of the world's largest open pit coal mines, the Cerrojón mine in Colombia, which is at the center of allegations of land grabs and forced evictions of local communities, some of them violent. The mine has also reportedly had devastating impacts on the local environment and the health of people living nearby. And Helica lives near the site of the mine, which is operated by a company called Cerajon. It is owned by three of the world's richest companies, BHP, Anglo-American and Glencore. These companies are very relevant to this debate as they're all listed in the London Stock Exchange and one is with one headquartered in the UK and one in Switzerland. And a large percentage of Cerahon coal is also sold in Europe. And Helica and her colleagues have been the target of a sustained campaign of intimidation because of their resistance to the mine. And this includes repeated death threats to them and their family members and children. And local residents say that neither Serahon nor its parent companies have ever been properly held to account for any abuses. And Helica, um, the Serahon company has faced widespread allegations of human rights and environmental abuses over decades and hasn't properly been held to account. What has the impact been on you? your family and your community. And I'd just like to invite everyone to click to the English if you're listening in English because Angelica will be speaking in Spanish. Thank you, Angelica.
Bueno, un saludo a todos y a todas, en especial al comisionado Didier Reiner. Pues decir que eh, mi nombre es Angélica Ortiz, hago parte del Movimiento Fuerza de Mujeres Guayú. Vivo en Aguajira, eh, vecina de Cerrejón, esta mina que ha estado por más de 30 años explotando nuestro territorio. Eh, decir también que pues empezar a reconocer las cosas como han estado hasta, hasta el momento, cómo se han visto perjudicadas nuestras familias, que son todas las comunidades, cómo se han visto perjudicadas la, los afluentes hídricos, eh, el territorio, el ambiente, pues se ha visto perjudicada en gran manera, teniendo en cuenta que han desaparecido más de 22 comunidades indígenas y afrodescendientes en el sur de La Guajira, donde se hace la explotación, la explotación del carbón, que ese mismo carbón que se explota aquí, que es trasladado a, a Europa, el eh, mismo que el cual eh, ha venido teniendo consigo graves consecuencias en la salud, en el territorio, en la espiritualidad, en la cultura y la pervivencia del pueblo guayú, del pueblo afro. Eh, se han ido dando avances y esos avances se deben también a que pues en nuestro territorio también han venido haciendo, hemos venido haciendo como la visibilización de la problemática. Estamos mirando con mucha preocupación todo lo que está siendo eh, afectado por la extracción, transporte y cargue del carbón. Eh, mirando cómo los las personas que, que han tocado, pues les ha tocado de, de manera más directa las afectaciones de la empresa eh, por la generación de, 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 de sus ingresos, mirando cómo vamos, eh, como cambiando la forma de hacer las cosas, pero al fondo a la empresa lo que le interesa es eh, el capital y la producción. Entonces, sí se han ido cambiando anteriormente, pues muchas poblaciones desaparecieron sin una consulta previa. En este momento, pues algunas consultas eh, eh, no han sido tan previas porque también han sido posteriores a, a acciones legales eh, aquí en Colombia. Y lamentablemente... Eh, el daño social por todos estos procesos, el desgaste de las comunidades, enfrentarse a, a, a debates jurídicos donde las comunidades no cuentan con los recursos para esto. Se dan la, las gracias y los agradecimientos a organizaciones nacionales como CINET, el CAJAR y otras organizaciones que han estado aquí, al igual que INDEPAS, con la cual realizamos un estudio de calidad de aire, calidad del suelo, en el territorio y encontramos que eh, de 17 puntos que se tomaron, eh, esta, este informe, estos informes fueron elaborados con datos de la Universidad de Cartagena de aquí de Colombia y la Universidad de Koblenz de Alemania. Esto fue financiado a la, gracias a la Agencia Católica Alemana y pudimos evidenciar con datos de la academia de decir que el agua está siendo contaminada. Esa agua es consumida por las comunidades, esa agua está siendo eh, utilizada. Ah, I think Angélica is just rejoining. Angélica. Hola. Hola. Hello. Hola, podemos escucharte. Ok, entonces todos estos problemas han traído consigo diferentes afectaciones, como les decía, y yo creo que la más grande es eh, de la preocupación que tenemos ahora que va a pasar con todo este territorio. En salud, pues, eh, para nadie es un secreto, pues la Guajira es una zona semidesértica de semidesértica, estamos ubicados al norte de Colombia, en frontera con Venezuela, eh, y esto trae consigo también en este momento el fenómeno migratorio, 
eh, las cantidades de agua que había en las comunidades para la subsistencia anteriormente hoy no es la misma. Lamentablemente, eh, creo que nos enfrentamos a una tercera crisis y la tercera crisis es por el agua. La segunda crisis, que, la cuarta crisis a la que nos veremos enfrentados es, ya no va a ser, y esto sí tiene que ver mucho con el planeta, tiene mucho que ver con el ambiente, el uso eh, acelerado que hay de las empresas por producir y acumular, producir y acumular en el tema de extranjerización de nuestro territorio. Y es eh, que todos estos daños que se hacen están contaminando el ambiente y lo pudo arrojar el examen de calidad de agua, que, de aire, perdón, que se hizo con estas universidades. Y vemos entonces cómo hoy estamos utilizando una mascarilla por el COVID, por un virus, pero siguiente, si no nos... Eh, si no nos damos la tarea de cuidar esta casa grande que nos ha parido, va a, nos va a tocar cargar bombas de oxígeno y ahí sí va a ser el siguiente negocio de, 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 este, de este siglo. Si ahora tenemos el agua embotellada, a la próxima serán las bombas de oxígeno para nuestra pervivencia. Eh, hacer un llamado pues, de, al, al, al comisario eh, y decir que, pues, aunque al territorio han venido eurodiputados, han venido accionistas de las empresas a mirar qué es lo que está pasando, vemos con preocupación porque eh, en el territorio, pues, las cosas no cambian o no están como quisiera, pues, la consulta previa no está siendo debida y llevada de, en la manera correcta pero también eh, la preocupación seguimos es eh, con la reducción del territorio para las comunidades. Eh, hemos estado por más de, de una década denunciando lo que viene ocurriendo en las comunidades, cuidando el planeta, cuidando esta casa grande, pero también cuidando eh, lo poco que tenemos que es nuestro territorio. Thank you so much, Angelica, for sharing your um, your story and the story of your community. Really appreciate that. Um, we'll now um, move on. Angelica, um, could you just ask um, your question to the commissioner? I think you had one question that you wanted the commissioner to answer. Eh, necesitamos un plan de cierre de mina obligatorio eh, y mirar cómo desde la comisión podemos eh, empezar a trabajar esto, que sea la comisión el espacio garante para poderlo hacer en cuanto a toda la remediación del daño que va a pasar con las más de eh, con las hectáreas que han sido arrasadas para darle paso a la minería. ¿Qué va a pasar con esos socavones que están? ¿Qué va a pasar con ese territorio y el agua contaminada? ¿Cómo nos resarse en el daño a, la, a las comunidades? Yo creo que esta, esta parte es Many thanks, una... Angelica. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so we'll now move on to our um, next speaker. Um, Angelica, if you could just go on mute. Perfect, thank you. Um, so our next speaker is um, Deepika Rao, Executive um, Director of um, CiviDep India. CiviDep is a Bangalore-based organization which works for workers' rights and corporate accountability. Um, and it attempts to empower workers and communities to ensure businesses comply with labor and human rights and environmental standards. So, um, uh, sorry, I'm just looking for my question. Um, do you can, um, what aspects do you think are needed in the proposed EU legislation? And also, what question do you have um, for Commissioner Reinders? Many thanks. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, thank you to all organizers of the event for inviting CBDEP to be a part of such an important uh, discussion. Um, it is our position that a binding EU-wide legislation could prove to be an essential step 
in ensuring fair working conditions and responsible conduct by businesses and can be a potential catalyst for truly transform transformative change. 70 to 80% of international trade happens over global value chains. Uh, multinational uh, corporations are often the most powerful actors in the global value chains as they're able to relocate and restructure their organizations through strategic decisions which would benefit their growth and sustenance over everything else. Uh, they are able to relocate to developing countries where they not only take advantage of the lower costs of production and relaxed labor and uh, environmental norms, but they are also able to distance themselves from the liability of being held accountable for the poor conditions which go. Uh, they, they, they also are able to distance themselves uh, from the liability of being held uh, accountable for the poor conditions which go into the production of their goods. Uh, neither the production country-based firms, uh, who, which are usually the suppliers to these multinational corporations, nor the production country governments are as powerful as multinational actors now have become. Uh, if I were to give a very uh, well-known example from India, it would be that of the Bhopal gas leakage. The gas, it is one of the uh, biggest industrial disasters uh, the gas explosion, uh, which took place in 1984, uh, is, is, I mean, it has not been limited to that one particular incident that happened in that year, uh, but it is an, it has been an ongoing situation where at least 600,000 people have been affected by the leakage of methyl isocyanate gas. The denial of justice then and the wait for justice now continues, even 36 years after the incident, and no one no one has been held responsible for this, including the parent company. The adverse impact of the gas leakage continues to have effects on survivors even today. The jurisdiction of production country governments uh, end, end at the border, but violations which cause deepening intergenerational poverty and deprivation uh, can, in today's globalized world, be caused by actions of multinational actors. Um, uh, traditionally, states have been regarded uh, as the primary institution to guarantee human rights and, uh, and also prevent other institutions from violating these, uh, these uh, human rights themselves. But, and this has resulted in corporations uh, not being regarded as a primary threat or responsible for uh, protection of human rights. Uh, even if corporations threaten human rights, states, the governments are expected to be considered to be primarily responsible to make sure human rights are protected and promoted. And uh, globalization and integration of national economies into global markets has created very, very fuzzy boundaries. Uh, while thinking about states' primacy over human rights remain the same, in practice, there is, in, there is, there is a mismatch between multinational corporations operating transnationally and the ability of states to regulate them. Transnational corporations have huge impact on the human and labor rights and environmental standards because their activities transcend national boundaries and they operate beyond the control of any one nation state. Uh, supply chain and production countries are very, very fragmented. And to a large extent, this is intentional to reduce risks, reduce liability of having to uh, take full responsibility of working conditions and related violations, and to res reduce costs and be resilient. But these fragmented supply chains, imp they impoverish the communities in which they are based. Uh, they are, and, and, and also impoverish the workers who work within these supply chains. There is no one actor to pin responsibility for violations and widespread uh, uh, tragedies caused by accidents. And the final responsibility is often pinned on the local supplier who himself is very powerless in this entire uh, chain. And one of the imperatives of global supply chain is also that it keeps production costs low. Wages are suppressed, of course, but freedom of association is also seen as a risk to this imperative. It is, and so it is very, very difficult for workers to unionize within global supply chains. And I'm saying this, uh, from uh, experience uh, of working in um, uh, supply chains that employ millions of workers in India 
global supply chains like that of textile, leather, and uh, electronic sectors. Um, suppliers just cannot afford to have even a sliver of uh, union activity thrive within the factory. Uh, work, so workers function uh, and work in these workplaces in a vacuum of power. They are not allowed to associate, they are not allowed to organize and come together to demand their rights. So it is every individual worker against a large powerful corporation. We have largely in our experience and uh, it, it has been documented very well uh, worldwide that voluntary mechanisms such as third party social audits have, have failed. They have failed because again, auditors uh, work under time and cost pressure exuded by multinational corporations. The, audit, the audits have time and again shown how they have failed to identify and remedy very blatant violations of law uh, and international standards. And they routinely do not identify systemic issues such as low wages, uh, lack of freedom of association, and the use of violence and sexual, uh, sexual violence as a disciplining tool, a tool for raising productivity within workplaces. This entire situation amounts to a lack of remedy and denial of justice for workers and communities and other victims of corporate wrongdoing. Uh, we have made formal submission to the commission, um, uh, uh, but, and I would like to just quickly touch upon a few, few key policy demands that we've made uh, in the submission. Uh, one is um, mandatory transparency in supply chains. The legislation should require businesses to publicly disclose their value chain through mapping of all tiers of the value chain uh, and extending to individual contractors, subcontractors, agents, all the way down to raw material. And second, the legislation should mandatorily require businesses to disclose information pertaining to number of employees along with nature of employment um, and as well as information on wages paid. Mandatory, such mandatory disclosure of information on the number of workers, nature of employment, and part of due diligence can uh, regulate excessive subcontracting and hire and fire policies, and which which have been largely seen to um, which have been largely seen to um, uh, lead to increasingly precarious uh, working conditions. Um, and, uh, uh, and a lack of access to decent work for uh, workers. A second key policy demand um, is that they should, uh, uh, is that the law should place a liability on corporations for yeah. breach of... Sorry, yeah. They, the law should place liability on corporations for breach of due diligence requirements and for human rights and labor rights violations and environmental harms. Thirdly, the laws, the, the, the mandatory human rights due diligence law should meaningfully and uh, should, should mandate meaningful and credible engagement with stakeholders, including uh, trade unions, uh, labor rights organizations, and communities, workers, and uh, vulnerable groups. Um, businesses should engage in social dialogue with stakeholders, uh, particularly trade unions and worker representatives, community members and uh, vulnerable groups who are most impacted by their decisions and operations. Vulnerable groups already, they lack the structural uh, power and therefore it is, it is imperative that the businesses are uh, recognized uh, this structural uh, vulnerability of, uh, of marginalized groups. Um, fourthly, uh, effect, effective access to remedy and justice. The third pillar of the UNGPs requires both states and businesses uh, to provide access to uh, effective remedies. Um, effective uh, grievance mechanisms gives voice to individuals and can serve and can serve um, uh, as early warning systems, and therefore also become tools for preventing negative human rights impacts. One of the most uh, effective way to have credible grievance mechanism um, is to operationalize freedom of association. Uh, We're going lastly, to have to yeah, wrap up very soon. Yeah, Thank you so much. That's my last point, yeah. Um, uh, lastly, one of the one major uh, main key policy recommendation would also to mandate right to information so that trade unions, 
worker representatives, labor rights and civil society organizations uh, can request for information on due diligence measures taken by the company, including mapping of uh, the value chain. Thank you. Thank you so much. And did you have a question also for the commissioner to answer? Yes. Uh, I would like to ask the commissioner what can be realistically expected uh, in the legislation with regards to uh, mandating transparency, making companies liable for harms caused and on access to remedy. So on transparency and access to remedy, what can be realistically expected uh, from the legislation? Thank you so much. And just a, a reminder of Angelica's question, which was what will the law do to obligate companies to engage with local communities? Um, Commissioner, would you like to respond um, to what you've heard from Angelica and Deepika? Uh, certainly, I, I try so to take the video, but I'm quite sure that you have stopped yourself the video. Okay. Maybe so, someone from the tech side could help put the video on. That would be great. Thank you. I will try to start if it's possible. Yeah. Perfect. We can see you and hear you now. Great. Thank you. I will, I will come back closer maybe to you if it's possible. Yeah, <laughs> it would be better. I'm sure. No, thanks a lot. I've listened to Angelica and Deepika. And first of all, I tried, I want to say that, of course, the um, uh, explanation given in the two presentations explain why it's so important to come with a binding uh, uh, legislative initiative and so it's very important to to make progress on this but of course it will be for the future so i fully understand that there are uh, some question about what the content of such an initiative i want to answer to uh, the pika that about the transparency is very clear we want to have a real transparency the reason why i mentioned sort of coherence with the uh, um, non-financial reporting directive because it's very important to organize transparency about the, the analyze made by the uh, board of the companies uh, about the risk and the possible impacts of their operations not only the operation of the company but also the operation of the supply chain and to organize a very important transparency about what they are doing to mitigate or to alleviate such a kind of risk or such a kind of negative impact uh, because if you don't have the transparency it's very difficult to organize the accountability and that's the second element i want to mention of course i've said we work on the liability or civil liability maybe also an administrative supervision by national authorities and a network at the open level of those national authorities like we have organized for the data protection to give an example with the the gdpr and the national data protection authorities uh, with the capacity to provide guidelines to provide also some uh, common interpretation of all the elements of the uh, uh, regulation or the directive for the, the the different provisions but also to impose sanctions and of course about the civil liability we'll uh, uh, pay attention to see who is in charge to uh, go to justice and to have an access to justice and maybe to organize some remedies and we are thinking about of course the shareholders like uh, it's the case but also a different kind of stakeholders and we are thinking about the possibility to discuss that with the trade unions with the local communities with uh, some ngos so not to open the door to all the different actors but to see what kind of organization uh, may have this uh, possibility to to move on this so uh, it's a real uh, Intention, I said, to be ambitious on this, so to have a broad scope, but also to organize a real transparency, to have a real accountability. And of course, when I'm looking to the two uh, presentations and remarks, uh, it's very important to go very far in the supply chain. You see that because if we don't have an impact if we don't go to the end of the supply chain, sometimes very far from the European Union. Then I, I want just to say that about uh, uh, the actual situation uh, in uh, Colombia and in the uh, way uh, to organize the phasing out of the exploitation of the mine uh, that show that, uh, of course, the future legislation will be useful, but we need also to work with other instruments and it's the same uh, in many other places. We need to work also with the trade policy and to take into account environmental issues, social rights issues, human rights issues also in our trade policy and in our development, in our development aid policy to support the different uh, uh, 
uh, capacities, capabilities from the different uh, uh, partners in the world. And then uh, we need to continue to work in multilateral fora to try to uh, organize a process when it's possible to not only have European rules, but take part in uh, international rules uh, in the UN or in other international fora. And I want just to say about the, the very concrete question of Angelica about what is possible to do with a multinational stopping the activities earlier than the end of the license in uh, uh, 2034, if I well remember something like that. Of course, it's possible to, to analyze the situation in relation with the international conventions, the contractual clauses, and maybe an existing civil liability. I'm not against uh, possibility for the Commission to examine your remarks on, on this. But again, I, I want just to conclude to say that the two uh, uh, examples shows very clearly the necessity to uh, organize an initiative on sustainable corporate governance, but with a real ambition and not to be uh, with a very small uh, uh, legislation without a real effect on the ground. And so, of course, you ask how it will be possible to, uh, to organize a real ambitious uh, program and a real ambitious uh, uh, legislative initiative. That will depend from the very broad support, not only from many uh, uh, civil society organizations, but also for the European Parliament. And I uh, thanks La Walter to be present again today, but also from the support of the member states and uh, to be able to convince the uh, businesses that it's very important to do that, to be more resilient in the future with a more sustainable uh, governance in their uh, organizations. But thanks a lot for such an opportunity. Sorry, because I, I need to leave the, the meeting, but uh, it was a real pleasure to listen to the two remarks coming from Colombia and India. Thank you so much, Commissioner Rangers, for joining us today, and particularly for your answers around access to remedy, which is very important to our two speakers. Thank you so much. So we'll move on to the second section of our um, event now. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I also just wanted to mention that Global Witness has contacted the Serahon Mine Company and its owners, um, Glencore, BHP, and Anglo-American, giving them an opportunity to comment to respond to the allegations made. And Serahon has responded as follows. Sarah Hon does not condone violence and rejects any accusation of being involved with paramilitary groups or being linked to any case of threats to social and community leaders. It denies allegations surrounding the mine and says it operates in compliance with the law and applicable standards. Anglo-American in Glencore stated that Sarah Hon is an independently managed joint venture and the company's full responses will be available shortly on Global Witnesses website. Um, so thank you so much to our speakers in the, the first round. Um, Angelica and, and Deepka will stay with us. Um, and now I'd like to introduce, um, I'm very delighted um, that um, MEP Lara Walters is joining us. Um, Lara Walters has um, been an MEP since 2019 and has been a real champion on corporate accountability issues. Um, she leads the Legal Affairs Committee report on corporate due diligence and corporate accountability, which next week, hopefully on the 9th of March um, will be voted um, in the full European Parliament plenary and um, this vote is poised to show real cross-party support um, uh, from the Parliament that the Commission takes an ambitious approach. So now I'll move on to you um, MEP Walters for your um, keynote speech. Many thanks. Unmute. Unmute. I think this should work now. Yes, we can hear um, you. Excellent. Thank you so much for organizing this. Thank you so much for the uh, wide area of speakers here. It's really interesting for me to listen to, and I'll also try to keep it short because I am much more interested in hearing these stories from the ground and being reminded of why we are doing this and you know what the real life consequences are um, in areas. Uh, such as the one in Colombia we're talking about today, for instance, um, I think that's really important and it gives us that extra sort of fighting uh, power that we, we will need, I'm sure, uh, throughout the rest of this, this process. Um, thank you also to Commissioner Reinders for his remarks here. 
Um, I imagine this is not an easy time also because his teams will have to plow through the uh, 450,000 or so responses. I think that is also much to the credit of many of the organizations present here today. I'm sure that many um, people on this, uh, on this Zoom session will have been involved in those. And I think it's really great that civil society came out in such force um, to uh, tell the Commission what is needed and, and what the problem is. Um, so that's really, really wonderful. I do feel for the people in the Commission, of course, who will need to wade through these and distill them into central messages, but um, hopefully there will be strong central ones that, uh, that will come out and that the Commission will be able to, to shape ambitious legislation with. Um, I think that the um, the, the, the examples here um, that we have listened to so far show us um, that value chains are uh, local always. And I think there's a saying that says that all politics is local. Um, I think value chains sometimes sound when we talk about them from a policy perspective and from, from, from Brussels, sound like things that happen in faraway places or things that, you know, are difficult to, to, to get an idea of because they might be uh, complicated, they might involve many layers and many people. Um, but this shows, of course, that there are real life consequences, very practical consequences, very real consequences um, to the things that we consider um, or that we, we take for granted. Um, and uh, energy, of course, is, is one of them, um, but, but clothes um, is, is another of them. And I think it's important that we bear that in mind and so that we uh, are reminded time and time again of our responsibility in ensuring that those value chains um, that they are responsible and that our businesses uh, do not hide as it happens time and time again. And I think that the, the statement you just read out, um, Rachel, shows that again, there always seems to be somebody to hide behind um, the Bhopal case that was mentioned is another one where this happened, of course, um, and that needs to stop. Um, the draft legislation that we are working on or that we are voting on rather next week um, as you will know, requires companies to identify, to avoid and to mitigate risk. Um, and what of course we want to avoid here is to um, companies limiting themselves to a tick box approach, um, because if that happens, then I don't think we will see real change on the ground um, in those value chains that is so important. Um, and of course that should apply to all risks, so to human rights, environmental and governance risks. And as Mr. Reinders has uh, luckily uh, subscribe to time and time again to the entire value chain. Um, it's been said today as well, um, also by the speaker from, from India, um, the, the, uh, the engagement with shareholders is also a key component of this. Um, luckily, of course, the OECD already uh, makes that a key component as well, but I think it is vital that we have strong wording on that in our legislation uh, on mandatory involvement with stakeholders um, through designing the, the due diligence process, um, but also um, when the process is not being designed. But I think it's important for companies to keep you know, their finger on the pulse um, also throughout the year um, so that um, the first that they hear of something or the first they say to hear something is not a scandal in a newspaper, but is a conversation with a local community, with a civil society organization on the ground and so forth. Um, and of course, ultimately, that should also help companies themselves in terms of avoiding risks uh, and legal costs. Um, uh, on that, I think what would also be important there is to make information available, of course, in the right format and in the right language for local communities. Of course, there's no use in having processes in place that, uh, that as a local community, um, you, you cannot read because they're in a, in a completely different language. Um, there's no use in, uh, in getting rights if you don't know what they are. Um, our law also explicitly refers to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, um, including free prior and informed consent um, and Indigenous people's right to self-determination. Um, companies should also give stakeholders access to grievance mechanisms. I think that has been mentioned before. Um, this is part, of course, of the wider question of access to justice. Um, and if, for instance, through this grievance mechanism, harm comes to light, uh, the company should work to remediate that harm and to address it meaningfully. Um, I think that it's often said that the COVID crisis presents challenges in terms of stakeholder engagement. 
Um, but of course, it also presents opportunities. And I think that many companies at the moment will be reviewing their value chains for vulnerabilities, will be looking at COVID and looking at the disruptions that they've had in their supply chains and seeing how they can eliminate some of those vulnerabilities. And they might be looking also at the countries or the sources that they um, do business with and seeing um, whether or not in the future um, it is risky to continue using those sources. And I think in that process, um, what will be important is to make sure this is not only an economic exercise um, or a, uh, an exercise of that type of risk management, but also an exercise of looking where the human rights risks are, because indeed they can cause disruptions as well, um, aside from the harm that they, that they can do. Um, and I think also that uh, COVID has shown us that while um, a country like Bangladesh might seem far away from, from, from New York, um, that uh, the way that we do business with each other today, uh, including right now, is very often now um, online, is very often via, via phone and video, um, and that essentially there aren't that many barriers also to getting the right stakeholder involvement. Um, crucially, our uh, draft legislation also, of course, improves access to justice for victims. There's some way to go there um, with a part of the plenary vote next week, not having been secured yet, um, but we have, we've made uh, steps towards it already, even in our broad political deal and the importance there being that companies can and should be held liable for the harm they caused or contributed along their value chains. And they need to be able to prove, of course, that they have done their utmost um, to avoid uh, that harm. Um, I will leave it there. Uh, I'm very interested to hear more from, uh, from the various people on this, uh, on this call and happy to take any questions afterwards. Thank you so much, Lara, and also for yeah all your work on this report that we um, very much hope is voted through next week, and and also for talking about the COVID implications as well. It's very um, very true, um, and you know business is being reassessed. Um, businesses are reassessing their supply chains right now. Um, perfect. We'll now move on to um, Chloe Cranston, who is the Business and Human Rights Manager at Anti Slavery International, um, and Anti Slavery is um, considered the world's oldest human rights organisation and works to address all contemporary forms of slavery. And Chloe leads anti-slavery's policy and advocacy work on forced labor in global supply chains. Um, so Chloe, uh, Chloe will present the outcomes of our joint campaign and the key policy asks for EU legislators. We'll then move after Chloe to um, a, a couple of rounds of discussion, depending how much time we have. Many thanks. Thank you very much, Rachel, and thank you to everyone thus far for their remarks. I too will try to keep it short because I don't think I'm the person here that everyone is here to listen to, um, but I'm here to present a summary about the work that we as anti-slavery together with Clean Clothes Campaign and Global Witness have undertaken together in the past months around the European Commission consultation. So in the past months, we have led a process to facilitate the involvement by people and organizations based outside of the EU, particularly in producing and sourcing countries in the consultation process. And the reason we did this is because we and our partners recognize the importance for those who are most directly impacted by corporate harm to be able to take an active part in the consultation, the shaping of the law, and to ensure that their views and experiences are heard first and foremost by the Commission. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry, it's going to be two slides ahead. So next slide, please. And as Global Witness has already laid out, we had a huge response to this. So almost half a million responses. And crucially for what we're speaking about today, this included 700 NGOs, grassroots organizations, trade unions, workers' organizations, and academic institutions from really all around the world. And what that really underscored is how important the proposed law in the EU is for everyone in the world and how all eyes are really on the EU to really make sure that the future law is effective. Next slide, please. So I'm here to share a little bit of what came through in these submissions. And in the submissions, the broad priorities of organizations around the world were clear. And these touched upon the range of corporate harm that we all know about well. So organizations underscored the need for legislation to be designed effectively to have positive impact, for example, to protect the rights of indigenous peoples and human rights, land and environmental defenders, to ensuring decent work and preventing forced labor and reducing um, environmental harm. Next slide, please. 
broadly in the submissions, we did see a clear consensus for many of the asks that civil society and trade unions in the EU have been calling for on the overarching principles that are needed in order for the law to hold companies to account. This included consensus that it must cover all types of companies, including financial institutions of all sizes and sectors that the definition of human rights and environmental due diligence must be in line with uh, international standards, that the law must cover entire value chains to include liability, enable access to remedy and justice for affected peoples, and to ensure mandatory engagement with stakeholders in the whole process. Next slide, please. However, more specifically, we wanted to take the opportunity to highlight a few specific points which were underscored in the submissions we received. First, we saw a clear ask to ensure that the law promotes continuous due diligence and doesn't just lead to risk avoidance, as MEP Walters has already alluded to, and in fact that it promotes supplier engagement. And in line with this, there was a clear call for the law to lead to companies to be addressing the root causes and drivers of harm in value chains, for example, including the purchasing prices of companies. Third, this has been mentioned by Civadep, but the vital fundamental importance of mapping and disclosure of value chains. So the point that companies can both better identify and address potential risks if they know their supply chain. And second, and importantly, that workers have better chance of seeking remedy if they know who they can address through the supply chain. Next slide, please. Fourth, and this point really came through across all stakeholders, so it's really one to underline, the need for a meaningful consultation with all stakeholders at all stages of the due diligence process and in accessing remedy, including in risk identification and assessments. And this includes with workers, with trade unions, of course, with communities, and with particular attention called for companies to be ensuring that they can meaningfully engage and they do meaningfully engage with groups who may face barriers to being involved in other processes. For example, migrant workers, home workers, lower caste work workers, or indigenous peoples. Next slide, please. And in line with this, there was a huge response to the uh, consultation from groups representing indigenous peoples around the world. And they made the call for the law to refer to the respect and protection of the rights of indigenous peoples in line with the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and the ILO Convention 169, and to mandate the obtaining of free and prior informed consent in relation to any business operation of a company and their subsidiaries. And next slide, please. And final slide is that they also underscored the need for access to remedy and justice, of course, but also underlining that any mechanisms to ensure access to remedy and justice must consider safeguarding and how to prevent unintended consequences, noting that there's a risk of retaliation and it needs to be made sure that victims don't place themselves in even more danger by trying to access and claim their rights. And finally, when progressing forward with this law, that the EU must consider other frameworks which can complement it in order to make sure that the proposed due diligence framework is effective. So this was a call to ensure that EU trade, development and foreign policy towards producing countries complements and reinforces the hopeful positive impact of the proposed legislation. So I'll stop there as I think everyone will be wanting to hear from my colleagues, but thank you very much for taking the, for taking the time to join us all today. Thanks so much, Chloe. And um, that was a really helpful overview and really sees the, the very strong and unified response from global civil society to the um, to the consultation. So now we'll just move into um, our um, final part of the um, event where we'll um, have a discussion with Angelica Dibka and um, MEP Lara Waters. So moving to you first, Angelica. Um, so you have described the effects of Sarah Hon's activities on your community. What would justice and adequate reparations or remedy look like for victims of abuses? And a reminder that Angelica will be speaking in Spanish. Hola, eh, bueno, yo creo que el papel que hemos venido haciendo como Fuerza de Mujeres Guayú eh, es el papel, el papel de visibilizar la problemática de las comunidades. 
Y para el tema de cómo remediar el daño, de, de cómo pues, se puede eh, reparar a las víctimas de todo lo que se ha venido sufriendo, las violaciones de los derechos humanos en el territorio, yo creo que es importante mirar que, que la justicia se cumplan las medidas y las leyes que tenemos y normas a nivel interno, pero también a nivel internacional. Creo que es una gran oportunidad los principios rectores siempre y cuando se, eh, se cumpla la cabalidad tal como sucede eh, eh, en el escrito. No es porque no tengamos leyes, no es porque no, no tengamos una orientación para las empresas, se tiene lo que nos hace falta es la voluntad. Por otro lado, no sé eh, si fue mal entendido lo que yo comenté, pero no, eh, el plan de cierre de mina del cual se está hablando es un plan de cierre que todo proyecto debe de tiene. Y nosotras nos estamos adelantando porque fueron más de 30 años de explotación y eh, quiere decir con eso que no se va a tardar en dos años para poder lograr el objetivo. Si la empresa se va a cerrar a 2034, no puede ser que en 2032 se empiece a trabajar. Es mejor empezarlo a trabajar desde ahora, mirar la reconversión laboral de las personas, la, eh, también mirar cómo se puede hacer un plan para la, mover la economía en, en nuestro territorio, aunque no haya encadenamiento directo, eh, aquí en el territorio, pero sí es verdad que hay algunas economías que se, o personas que se, se benefician de la economía de la empresa. Por otro lado, decir que en ningún momento he culpado o he dicho que la empresa es eh, la directa responsable de nuestras amenazas, sería muy irresponsable de mi parte decirlo. Eh, que la empresa esté involucrada y en, en hechos de amenazas o de ataques. No ha habido investigación como tal, no puedo decirlo tampoco, ni la Fuerza de Mujeres Guayú lo va a decir, teniendo en cuenta que para poderlo afirmar tiene que haber una investigación judicial que eh, diga esto fue o vino de. Entonces, cabe aclarar eso. No tenemos nunca la Fiscalía General de la, de la Nación nos ha dicho sus amenazas provienen de, sabemos que son, eh, eh, los firmantes son grupos armados, es cierto, y eh, porque están escritos en los panfletos donde hemos estado, porque han llegado a través de mensajes de texto, pero no podemos decir esto lo hizo la empresa porque al decir eso eh, estamos incurriendo en una grave falta. Entonces espero que se pueda traducir esta parte de la manera más clara posible, porque no he culpado ni la, a los accionistas de las empresas, pero tampoco he culpado a Cerrejón de esta situación. Sí hemos venido siendo atacadas, sí hemos venido siendo amenazadas, han habido desplazamientos a nivel interno de la organización. Es más, hay una mujer exiliada del territorio, pero... No, no puedo decir eh, esto viene por parte de empresa porque sería de manera irresponsable hacerlo. Entonces creo que el llamado, y retomando la pregunta que, que me hacen, el llamado es a que la empresa se siente con todas las comunidades a las cuales ha sido, han sido víctimas de, de, de desplazamiento, de desarraigo de su territorio o desaparición de una fuente hídrica mirar cómo se remedia y quién es mejor que las comunidades para decir eh, la forma en cómo quiere ser compensada o cómo quiere mitigar el daño que se le ha ocasionado. Thank you so much, Angelica, and, and for really talking about the, the threats that you're receiving on, on the ground. Um, yeah, it's, I think it's very harrowing to hear. Um, I'll new, now move on to um, Deepika, 
Um, so how would an EU law on mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence change the way you work and defend workers and communities and the environment? Will it facilitate your work and how? Um, thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, in, in response to this question, I would like to take the example uh, of the crisis brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. Multinationals canceled orders which had been placed. Uh, many even refused to pay for orders that had been completed. Um, this resulted in millions of workers in India uh, not getting paid for several months. Uh, and having to dig into their uh, retirement funds, take expensive loans, um, and uh, and go several several meal, skip several meals uh, in just in order to uh, tide over the crisis. Though several workers have started uh, restarted work since then, uh, several have permanently lost jobs. Um, Unions and labor support organizations have had little or no success in claiming back wages uh, or final compensation amounts for workers who lost their jobs. Um, if, um, if a mandatory human rights due diligence law was in place, uh, companies could be held to account. Such companies who, who uh, 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 ren reneged on their commitments could be held to account for their behavior. Uh, requiring them to exit business um, uh, or to cut down business in, in a responsible manner. Um, and the depreciation, uh, the limit of it would have been uh, uh, far lesser than it was. Um, according to some estimates, um, the back wages owed by brands, uh, by garment brands, um, over the months of March, April, and May uh, 2020, uh, in the textile industry in India, uh, textile industry worldwide uh, is to the tune of three to five billion US dollars. So CVDEP um, continued to do relief work through most of the of last year, and we continue to do so now as well uh, because of the widespread distress and deprivation that we have been firsthand uh, witness to. Uh, we have been raising money uh, with private in individuals and uh, philanthropists to uh, alleviate the distress um, and, 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 and we are not able to, uh, of course, reach out to all workers or, uh, 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 or compensate them for loss of uh, uh, household incomes, uh, monthly incomes. Um, but there, there were no, they have, there have been no formal avenues to hold brands to account um, and to negotiate with, with brands to um, support workers tied over the crisis. We, I mean, we realized that it was a time where business had to take tough decisions, but it could have been done in a responsible, uh, far more responsible manner. Um, and had there been a human rights um, a due diligence uh, law in place, uh, this, this scenario would have been uh, markedly different. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deepka. And I think that's such an important point that you're that you're making that when there's a big shock to the system, whether it's a global pandemic or a financial crisis, that this always has the most impact on on vulnerable workers. And that despite the fact we have international voluntary standards such as the OECD guidelines or the UN guiding principles, that actually when it came down to it there were no mechanisms um, for workers or communities to to bring cases or to to seek some kind of remedy um, so thank you very much for outlining that so i'll move finally to to mep mep waters um, i guess based on what you've heard um, how do you view that this law can serve the global south um, communities um, that we've had represented here today um, from india and from colombia and particularly those at the forefront of corporate abuse um, and if you have any final comments you want to give before we wrap up thank you Just waiting for my video to come on. I don't think I can turn it on myself. Um, okay, there we go. 
there we go. Um, without wanting to go into the the, the technicalities of the of the uh, of the legislation, but I think that the most important thing um, will be um, more clan that question of is this coming from the company um, that was asked. So this question of what is happening on the ground and the adverse impacts that are being created um, and workers that are being asked to um, work without pay or people that are being forcefully removed from their um, from their their homes, is that coming from the company? Um, and the reason that we should have more clarity on that is that we're 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 telling companies that they need to know what's going on in their value chains and they need to show what's going on. So they need to know what's going on, or at least they need to show what they're doing uh, to address it. And so that uh, requires then uh, transparency, that requires them to say um, what it is they're doing to address certain issues. Um, and it has legal implications as well, because there's uh, the, the, the burden of proof if anything happens is on them. So they will need to say, um, you know, if if uh, something happens in a mining village somewhere, um, if they provide the, the response of, well, we just didn't know, we weren't aware, then that is not good enough anymore. Um, because usually these things don't happen, um, you know, hidden away in, in a cave somewhere. I mean, these things are usually flagged by NGOs, by stakeholders, by workers trying to talk to their management. Um, and so if there's any evidence of that, of it having been, having been flagged, um, but being ignored, um, then that's not good enough. And that means that the, the, the company isn't meeting the sort of test of the burden of proof and having to show um, what it has done. Then it'll just show that it has willfully ignored information that it should have acted on. Um, and so um, that question of, is this coming from the, from the company or not? Has this been you know, company instructions or not? is important and this this um, idea of the company no longer being able to hide so easily behind well that's our, our daughter company um, because we are also trying to improve um, access for, for for victims even for um, for companies with um, with daughter companies in in that third country um, so those things are, are important um, and of course we hope that uh, that in the end, um, that this will, will create a general culture change because all companies will start doing this. Um, all companies will be looking at each other um, and, and, and seeing how you can most efficiently also make sure that you meet these requirements. So of course, I would hope that um, this will serve to, to, to avoid many of the instances we have heard about in the future, um, but also that this will no longer be an obligation that um, you know we need to force feed to companies, but something that they will taking up. Uh, they will be taking up quite naturally. I think there's a very long way uh, to go until then. I'm I'm not under any illusion that that will happen overnight. Uh, but of course, ultimately, that would that would be the aim of this. For this to become, um, you know, a a um, uh, for this to to, to become the norm, um, rather than than some sort of legal novelty, um, that um, that they that they all struggle with. Um, I'll leave it there because I think Rachel, you might want to uh, to wrap up. Uh, but thank you very much to, to all other speakers here and thank you so much again. Thank you so much MEP Waters and um, yes it's been a fantastic event over the last hour and a half. Thank you so much to everyone that has joined us. Um, you have really heard um, directly from communities affected, particularly I would like to thank Angelica for joining um, from Colombia and really talking about her story and the community that she represents, um, all of the threats and harassment and, and, and problems that she has been um, and, her, and her community and her organization has been working on for the last 30 years. It's, it's 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 very um, humbling to to have you here with us and to to hear directly from from the communities and it's so important that um, those of us who work in um, bubbles like the the European bubble or um, in other um, kind of uh, Western countries that we actually hear directly from communities affected. So thank you so much for um, for joining us today and also for talking about um, all of your work to to resist 
some of these environmental and, and human rights harms that you are seeing on the ground. Thank you so much also to Deepka um, for all the work that your organization is doing to support um, workers and, organ and, and communities in, in India. Thank you so much for giving the direct um, testimony um, of your work, particularly with COVID and how it's affected um, workers in India. Um, it's, it's again, extremely humbling to hear about. And, and again, um, I think all of these, um, these problems that we've heard about um, need to be addressed through the legislative process. Um, and moving on to the legislative process, thank you so much to the Commissioner um, Didier Reinders and to MEP Lara Walters, both for joining today, but also for your um, con continued commitment and dedication to this work and the necessity of this work. And I think it's very clear um, that from both the Commission side and the Parliament side that there's a very clear understanding of, of really what the issues are uh, and what some of the solutions um, really are um, in terms of this legislation. Um, as MEP Walters said, we're at the beginning of a journey, um, but certainly um, Global Witness, um, Clean Clothes Campaign and Anti-Slavery International, um, you know, as put forward by Chloe earlier, um, we feel that, you know, with certain really important um, policy um, recommendations being included in the legislation that's upcoming, um, we, we could really see um, quite um, a big difference in terms of the lack of accountability that we see um, from companies and particularly their operations operations in producer countries um, and in the vis-a-vis uh, -vis more vulnerable workers and communities and indigenous um, groups um, on the ground. Um, so I just want to thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to flag that um, moving forward, we're expecting um, the legislation from the Commission um, around summertime this year. So we very much hope that everyone on this call will engage with, um, with that process. Um, as mentioned earlier, Earlier, um, the European Parliament report that MEP Walters has very much been championing and has been the rapporteur on is being voted next week in um, the European Parliament and that will very much represent um, an ambitious proposal from the European Parliament um, to the Commission to bring forward um, a strong and robust law. And we will, of course, continue to work with our global partners such as Angelica and Divka um, to make sure that, um, that those most affected by corporate abuse are, have a voice in this debate and are very much at the forefront of policymakers' minds. So thank you so much for joining. I just wanted to thank everyone who's helped organise this event as well. There's many, many people behind the scenes um, who are not on camera, um, such as Richard, Alice, um, Anna, um, Julia, Julianne, um, many other people um, from across our organisation. So thank you so much for all your work. It would not have been possible. Um, and just thank you so much to everyone that has joined. Um, we will probably have another event um, this year. So please keep um, in touch um, via our websites um, of the main organisations. Thank you so much and have a nice evening or um, or morning or or uh, or afternoon. Thank you. Bye.